Welcome back to Three Black Guys with the Mic. Uh, we are honored to be joined again by RNC, former RNC chairman, as well as uh, MSNBC uh, political commentator. I hope I said that right. Mr. Michael analyst. is back um, analyst. with us. Michael, how are you? I'm good. Political analyst. Just For analyst. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. I don't. I don't <laughs> commentate. I <I'd> analyze. <laughs> <laughs> What's the difference between the count, uh, analyst and the commentator? Yeah, a commentator just runs his mouth, and the analyst has to think first. Oh, got it, got it, got it. Oh, okay, go. okay. Now I know. Now, now when I see who's the commentator, now I know what that stands for. So, uh, so wait, I, so Spud, does does that mean Tucker Carlson's not an an, an analyst? He's a commentator. <laughs> oh, not not even that. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna go. I love Tucker. Uh, I'm sorry. That's just that's just running your mouth. <laughs> right, right. Um, I my I know we're doing you know COVID right now. I know um we're not going anywhere, but hopefully by Thanksgiving this thing will be over because I follow you on Instagram and that turkey was off the chain. That, <laughs> Thank you, baby. Thank I, I saw you. that turkey and I was like, I'm definitely headed to Michael Steele's house for Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> was off the chain. How have you been doing during this uh, COVID time? You know, I, it's surprisingly blessed. Not surprisingly blessed. We're all blessed uh, to be alive and healthy for sure. Um, but, you know, I, I, I feel, you know, doubly blessed in that, uh, you know, I've got two elderly parents um, who, uh, and my sister, a lot of people know, uh, suffers from MS. And, you um, you know, you just there's so many avenues that could could take you down a dark road that uh, we've been very, very fortunate. My kids are well. The wife is well. Parents are doing well. My sister and her family. So in that sense, very, very fortunate um, work is picked up, which is good. And, and I really was excited to see so many Americans uh, going back to work uh, almost a month ago. But, you know, knowing that we've got more corners to turn and there's more literally trouble ahead um, as we see new spikes in COVID-19 and in and, and new parts of the country. And um, so I think we all, in, in many respects, uh, given everything, um, the, the downturn in the economy, certainly the murder of George Floyd, which has upended, thankfully, the civil discourse that we have around race and, and things like that, um, that we're still able to engage because we're healthy. Right. If you were still the uh, running the RNC, how would you address the convention this year with COVID? If I were run the RNC uh, at this point, they probably <laughs> they would have fired my ass a long time ago. <laughs> Even quicker than they did the first time. Um, <laughs> No, it just it this just would not would not stand. We would not be having a national convention. We damn sure wouldn't be having it in the middle of August in friggin' Florida of all places. Right. Um, I would not have walked out on the city of Charlotte, even though there's still still doing operational um, matters related to the convention uh, there. Um, we would be doing what the Dems are doing. We would be doing a virtual convention. And maybe, maybe uh, doing uh, a a sort of town hall kind of setup for uh, the night that our nominee uh, would uh, give his speech. Um, but even that would be uh, with with an all appropriate CDC social distancing guidelines, et cetera. Uh, but we would not have 10, 5, 20,000 people. Um, in a room, and um, we certainly would not be asking people to descend upon a state that is now going through a spike um, four weeks before our national convention. It's just the most harebrained, dumbass thing I've ever seen, and it's unfortunate that people are following um, Trump instead of doing, well, instead of applying common sense. What is your thoughts? I have to just ask this. I'm so curious. What are your thoughts of like the new voices of, you know, conservatives like, you know, Candace Owens and Benjamin Backer and Diamonds and Silk and Blexit? What is your, you know, thoughts on on new voices of? I, I wouldn't necessarily call that conservatism. If you go back and you look at the roots and the history of Republicanism, 
uh, that's where I stand, number one. I call myself a Lincoln Republican for a very uh, important reason. It's because it's, uh, I believe, fundamentally and foundationally in how the party came into being, born out of the abolitionist movement around the idea that every human being who is a United States citizen um, has equal rights and should be treated accordingly. Um, the early civil rights history of that party uh, that uh, gave us 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment. And yes, the, there was the yin and the yang and the tensions and, the, uh, and all of that that goes into any political process, but fighting for the ultimate outcome of, of the rights of African Americans, um, not as three-fifths a person, but as a whole man and a whole woman um, in this land. And so... Um, the move into the conservative space post Barry Goldwater in, in 1964, uh, the embrace of um, of uh, the Southern strategy under Nixon uh, to woo white, uh, uh, you know, Dixiecrats who were pissed off at Johnson for embracing civil rights. Uh, that is now, uh, you know, in my view, sort of morphed into this uh, bastardization of of conservatism. Uh, I think that that pretends a great fight ahead over exactly what it is. I think people I you know I've I've all long said that one can be a conservative and not a Republican. I know many conservative independents and many conservative Democrats. Um, and one can be a Republican, um, you know, or, or conservative and not a Republican or a Democrat, or excuse me, um, a, uh, a Republican and not a conservative. And, and so I know a lot of Republicans who fall, you know, maybe, you know, uh, into a different bucket. So the party's always been one, and that's how it kind of played this big tent uh, uh, idea, was that everyone, regardless of where you were along the political spectrum, were drawn into the party uh, by a single uh, defining thread, which talked about freedom and limited government and, you know, a sound foreign policy, et cetera, et cetera. So what we see playing out now, gentlemen, is is not uh, certainly conservatism that I uh, had come to know and when I joined the party, you know, 40 some years ago. Um, and that's something that's going to get worked out, you know, either during a, a second term of Donald Trump or immediately after he's uh, booted off the stage in November. Uh, one way or the other, it's a battle that's going to have to happen. And uh, I think you will see a decoupling to some degree of this idea of the Republican Party as absolutely and, uh, and only conservative, but um, more broadly speaking, embracing um, tenets of conservatism and, and you know, tenets of, of you know, uh, modern day liberalism to the extent that, you know, it serves a greater, bigger public policy and and public uh, interest. So, I have a couple of questions where we where we are now, and and what I've always kind of been curious as to how so many of the right now the Republican Senate uh, can go along with and help me understand this. Do these people understand that they're part of history? Because I feel like they're very transactional and not seeing themselves in a larger, grander scheme of things. Uh, I think it, it, it has become much more transactional. It's something that I've I noticed in the party uh, going back to when I was state chairman. Uh, so that's going back to 2000. Um, and watching over the last 20 years a greater growth in the sort of transactional nature, which Donald Trump perfected in many respects and actually dialed into in a way that um, that Karl Rove and a lot of other folks, um, um, you know, only really kind of began um, to sort of create this sort of class of vendors and, and lobbyists and uh, consultants who wind up running a lot of the operational stuff inside the GOP, which ultimately wound up pissing off the, the base. So now you find yourselves kind of stuck between these two worlds that are driven largely by the um, uh, those two uh, interests, uh, the base, you know, grassroots party interest and and that, you know, consulting class uh, that is out there uh, working, working the, the dollar signs. And what I realized when I was national chairman was 
that part of the base that was grassroots oriented uh, felt more and more detached from the party as a whole when that was the, the birth of the of the Tea Party. So the question then became, so how do you kind of hold those pieces together in order to continue to win or to win elections so that you can begin to rebuild the party uh, from inside, uh, or do you let it go? And I think what happened was we were able to build back to a certain point. But then after the 2012 election uh, and reversions to the old style, well, the consultant class regained footing inside the GOP um, and began to engage in the same old behavior, which led to further disintegration of that relationship with the base. Trump came in uh, and played and played it like a fiddle. I said all that, to answer your question this way, so you understand contextually why what I'm about to say makes sense. So now you have leaders who are who before would run roughshod over that base because they had this class of players out here, vendors, uh, consultants, etc., who were churning the dollars, right? Uh, and and they and they realized, you know, well, hell that base is going to vote wherever we spend the money, however we spend the money, right? So the vote will follow the money and we'll just direct everybody that way. And we'll, we'll take our piece off the top and keep moving. Trump comes along and turns that equation on his head. And now the base threatens those folks. So those, those elected officials can no, are no longer listening to the guys who are writing the checks. Who are they listening to? They're listening to the people behind the man that they're following, all right? So the people behind Trump. Uh, we just saw that play out in uh, the South Carolina Senate, excuse me, the Alabama Senate race uh, uh, with the former attorney general. Uh, Mr. Beauregard himself, right, uh, is, is, you know, lost his primary um, once, you know, Trump made it clear uh, that Jeff Sessions was not his guy. Um, and and where did that where did that base go? Where did those numbers go? They didn't follow the money. Sessions had the money to be competitive. Right. They follow Trump. But now and now, that's why they act the way they act. And that's why the leadership responds the way they do. But around the country, in many in many races, Donald Trump's coattails have been largely ineffective. There've been, you know, we, you know, Trump comes in. He, ultimately, he loses the house. That, well, you know, I, I beg to differ a little bit on that. Um, yes, they lost the house, and 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 there are a myriad of reasons for why that happened, um, and and that goes partly to what you've just described. Uh, but you also have to look at the fact that the president's track record, even including. Uh, losing the House, um, and keeping in mind that in a lot of those races, Trump didn't endorse anybody. Um, he was not out in front on behalf of any particular candidate. But in the races where he was, his candidates won. So, uh, you know, that's some of the thinking that's going into this November, and particularly while we're still in this primary season, um, weighs heavily in that vein of, does the president get in the race, number one? Who does he endorse if he does get in the race, number two? And what is the potential outcome once he's in the race and makes an endorsement that the candidate he picks wins or loses? And so the bet is that in most cases, as again played out in Alabama, it doesn't matter that you were the U.S. senator that we love so dearly and so much, and you were the first one out of the gate to endorse Donald Trump. At the end of the day, Donald Trump don't like you no more. And guess what? Neither do we. It doesn't matter what else you did. Right. And so that's that's the narrative that keeps pushing Mitch McConnell, who wants to hold the Senate um, after 2020 um, and keeps pushing Republicans in the House and the Senate alike. And even individuals like Governor DeSantis of Florida um, to behave and to say and to do the things that they do because they don't want to be on the, not just on the wrong side of Trump, but on the wrong side of Trump voters. And so the question will be played out this November, do the American people as a whole, the other 60 plus percent of us have a say going forward in that relationship, in the dynamic of that relationship between elected Republicans and the base and, and the voters as a whole 
especially if they wind up losing the Senate uh, and potentially more seats in the House. So, so that bleeds right in or leads right into my question. And I want you to pull out your crystal ball. And I ask this to everyone because I okay. know you have one up under your desk. Yes. And we have. Yes. Hey, Mr. Eldry, I, think, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, I think we have like 109 days, if I'm not mistaken, 110 days away. Yeah. And I also and, and, and this is, you know, before I ask you, what does your crystal ball say? I have to also say. I really enjoy you when you're on my guy's show, uh, Bill Maher. And I got to ask you this. Sure. And Bill has said this many times. In your crystal ball, if it says that Donald Trump loses, will he leave? And if he doesn't leave, what do we do? Uh, will Donald Trump leave? Well, Donald Trump will ultimately leave, yes. He will ultimately leave on January 20th, 2021, um, it, even if that means being escorted out of the House uh, out of the White House by uh, the military and whomever else, uh, uh, President Biden so claims, because it doesn't matter. The inauguration will take place on the 20th of January and a new president will be sworn in. So that part of the process cannot be stopped. I don't care if you don't, if you don't want to pack up your jet and get out of the house, that's on you. <laughs> Just know that the new landlord is is not going to play with you. Right. And there are going to be trucks out front moving your crap out while he's getting sworn in. So that process, that part of the process is going to happen regardless of what Trump may think or want in that in that space. What that convers that question really cuts to is what happens election day to January nineteenth. All right. So what happens in that space of time? How does Trump behave? Well, you know, if he loses, he's going to behave badly. Yes. Uh, and, and, and what do I mean by that? Well, that means he's going to send out a phalanx of, lo of lawyers across the country to key battleground states to tie up the process of voting. And why is that poss a real possibility? Because at the end of the day, we will not know who the nominee, who the new president is officially until probably even up to weeks later because of the way this uh, election December, is going to play out. December 14th. Absentee ballot voting right. is going to be a big part of this. Vote by mail is going to be a big part of this. this is why I encourage citizens right now, those of you who are watching this on YouTube, those of you who are listening to listening to my words on podcasts, please, 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 as soon as your state allows for you to receive an absentee ballot or a vote by mail ballot, get it. Get it. You don't need to wait to October to figure out who you're going to vote for. I think a good portion of the American people know who the hell they're voting for as of right now. That's After right. COVID-19, the collapse of the economy and the murder of George Floyd and the reaction of this incumbent to all of those things, I think you got a clue. So you don't need to wait till the last minute to gum up the works on the back end. While the federal government you know, screws around with getting money into the states, so that your state, my state, and all of the 50 states of this great union can put in place the infrastructure to accommodate not a 10% uh, vote by mail turnout, but a 60, 70, or 80% vote by mail turnout. You need to get a little bit ahead of the curve. So get those ballots early. If you want to know how to do that, how to secure that information, and to know all you need to know about the voting process in your state, I'm chairman of the U.S. Vote Foundation. Go to usvotefoundation.org, click on, click on your state, and we got it all right there for you to make it as easy as possible. So that's part one. That, that process is going to take some time, and we need the American people to understand that and to try as best they can to get of the her, uh, ahead of the curve on that so that you're not sitting there waiting for a ballot to come uh, at the end of October that arrives late that then pushes pushes you either out of the election because you you don't get it returned by election day it has to be postmarked by the day of the election or you get it um, you get it in in time but because there's so much coming in at the same time um, it gets lost something happens the process breaks down whatever 
Um, so that's part one. And the part two will be the transition itself. How helpful will a an outgoing Trump administration be with an incoming Biden administration? I would advise the Biden people to um, probably uh, start now, if they haven't already, talking with uh, and Mr. Biden knows this from the transition between Obama and Biden, I mean, uh, Obama and Trump, that um, get your hands on as much information as early as you can, um, because the, the lack of cooperation will likely be stunning because the president will likely tell his people, you know, until we know the final results of this election, there is no transition. Well, that's not how this works. Right. Um, and so it's it's going to be a um, real challenge for us as a country and a real constitutional press for us uh, as we watch this thing unfold. I hope not. Um, but knowing Trump as I do, it would not surprise me. And I don't think we should be surprised or just need to be smart. Yeah, I'm glad you said that about uh, absentee. We voted absentee and just actually just sent us back in. Um, and, and, May, and Lamont has actually been talking about, you know, absentee for a very long time, you know, because especially like with a lot of, you know, polling places being closed and they're like shutting them down sure. in, in cities, you know, you people are standing in line six hours, four hours, you know, whatever. They can't even get the opportunity to be able to cast their vote. So voting right. absentee is definitely important. I got two questions for you. What are your thoughts on the um, Black Lives Matter movement and what the attention is for African Americans in this country now. You know, when you look at corporate America and a lot of, you know, corporate businesses are, you know, now standing with, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And is this, is the Black Lives Matter movement hurting or helping, you know, America? At this moment. Well, let's go back to the very beginning of the Black Lives Matter movement. And I remember saying to uh, a number of my uh, friends uh, in the Republican Party uh, and even independents around the country who were, you know, questioning um, its legitimacy and questioning its value. Um, my argument to them was you the fact that you would question whether black lives matter purely in a strict political context tells me you don't understand why black lives matter mm -hmm. and 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 the fact that this has been part of a 400 year struggle that um now has been you know sort of symbolized and crystallized into three words because Black Lives Matter in 2016, um, uh, and, excuse me, in 2020, uh, matter uh, just as much as they did in 1619. Mm -hmm. and, and so for me, the movement has always been about uh, getting white folks to appreciate one simple thing, particularly in response in their response to Black Lives Matter initially, that, well, all lives matter. Um, and, and, and the fact is, uh, we didn't say that. We didn't say all my lives, you know, didn't matter. What we said was black lives matter too. And that's all we want you to understand is that yes, all lives matter. And, and you can hide behind that all day long, but at some point you're going to have to confront the reality that within all lives matter, how you treat these black folks matters too. Right. And that's like the, you know, the the National Kidney Association, or, or they're all about kidneys, but they didn't say when people's hearts to fail. You know, right. you know. <laughs> so true, <laughs> so true. So yeah. I, I, the other thing, the other takeaway for me is, I'm glad y'all finally coming to the to the table. Thank you. You're welcome. Come on, you know. I mean, I whoa, looked whoa, at Juneteenth. I looked at I you looked at Juneteenth to, to our table. You come yeah. on. I mean, I'm, thank you for coming. I'm glad to hear. I'm glad to hear. It's like, wow. You know, I was watching, I mean, you know, I was watching all these conversations go on, both on my air and other networks. And, you know, these white folks who get on, the first thing they say, I just want to say right before I begin, Black Lives Matter. And I'm like, <laughs> right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Right. Juneteenth comes around. I had to text a friend of mine. After after my sixth hour of watching uh, Juneteenth celebrations and pro, you know protests and marches, 
where there were clearly more white folks than black folks, right? <laughs> and I was like, you know, white folks are more black on Juneteenth than black people. I, I don't understand, right? And, you know, my buddy of mine said, you know, yeah, I just noticed there were a lot of white folks here with this particular protest. I said, yes, because we're at the barbecue. That's what we do on Juneteenth. <laughs> That's where we are. We get it. So look, you know, we appreciate all of the, all of the, all of the love and all of the recognition, all the appreciation. Yes, Colin Kaepernick was right. Okay, and and it's it's nice that everyone finally realizes that you got punked mm. by one of the biggest punkers there is, uh, or one of the biggest punks there is on on this subject. Um, and we now have to figure out how we take those baby steps going forward. Uh, and put together the kind of conversation, which I, I'm going to tell you, fellas, while all of that's going to happen, it really has to happen in our home first, in our community first. We have to come up with our agenda of what we want. And, and that's our demand, all right? And, and we can no longer sit by and tolerate the killing uh, in, our, in our neighborhoods. Um, we can no longer tolerate the, the miseducation of our children. We can no longer tolerate the redlining of our neighborhoods. We can no longer tolerate being gentrified out of, uh, out of communities that we built, mm. you know, that, that, we, that we had survived and revived when white folks saw us coming and moved their ass to the suburbs. Now they're sending their grandkids back in, charging, uh, paying us penny on the dollars for a house that we've held for 75 or 80, 80 years, and then charging, charging it back out uh, to white folks for seven, eight, 10, 20 times that amount, and we ain't getting any of that. Right. So we have to draw the line and say, you know what? Now, that's not how this is going to roll up, all right? So we're going to do this a little bit differently. Here are the demands, because if we do not make demands of this culture, this government, this society, this country, then we have no stake in the American dream because everyone else is carving out their dream the way they see it. But when it comes to our community, we're left with leftovers on a good day mm -hmm. or we're allowed to have just a few very lucky, wealthy individuals. We can do more than one Oprah. We can do more than one Bob Johnson and, and Bob Smith, Robert Smith. All right. So the reality of it is we have a whole lot of Oprah's and Robert Smith's within our community, and it's going to be up to us to unleash them. And so that's how I kind of look at the Black Lives Matter movement right now, the 21st century version of what Dr. King and Malcolm X and so many others were pushing in the 1960s, how that manifests itself today. And whether or not this generation uh, is ready to lay out its demands and then follow up on those demands by having expectations met first within our own community. Because nobody else is going to give us respect if we don't respect ourselves. Yeah. And if we allow others to dictate the terms of how we engage, how do you think they're going to engage with us? Yeah. My last question to you, Michael, is before I pass it, is... is um. What are you doing to stay so young? I mean, I'm looking at your skin right now, brother, and you are like glowing. I'm like, talk about black don't crack. I mean, what is going on? And again, I follow you on too. Instagram. So I see you drinking Tito's and you got rum and all this other stuff. And I'm like, what is Michael doing to keep this skin so young? Because I need to change up my regimen. <laughs> Did you say glowing, Spud? I mean, my yeah. man, it, 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 I don't know if it's the light or what, but I mean, the melanin is popping right now. <laughs> well, first I put on a little foundation. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have makeup in our budget. So. <laughs> No, I, look, I'm just I, I'm I'm just a blessed brother. That's all I am. Uh, I'm the son of Maybell and John, right? And um, you know, I just uh, I just look at life and I just I take it as it comes, and I don't let it wear on my face. <laughs> it's got to stay perfect. <laughs>
<laughs> right. So, right. So, Michael, I got a question for you. You, you mentioned Michael. I mean, sorry, you mentioned Mitch McConnell. And I, I, as I go backwards and I think about this, we all knew that Hillary Clinton was going to win. Like the world was aware that she was going to win. But he takes this long shot bet that nobody else would have taken. Like if you if you'd have taken this bet in that time frame when he decided to, to stop um, Barack's a Supreme Court nod, Vegas would have been like, Psh, are you crazy? Did he know something? And I don't mean like he had a hunch in his heart right. and his gut. I mean, did he know something? No, and I, I would actually disagree with the premise of your question, because uh, not all of us thought Hillary Clinton would win. Um, I remember writing a piece back in October um, that I thought Bernie, Chan Bernie Sanders would, would, be, would have a greater opportunity to be the nominee of the party than Hillary. And I still contend, but for two factors. One, uh, his organization and structure taking off a month sooner, or his organization and structure having uh, a month on the back end, not even a full month on the back end, I think he would have been. I think, I think the momentum in that campaign, which scared the bejesus out of, out of Hillary Clinton's team, um, would have propelled him to the nomination if he had uh, more time on the back end. Uh, and I really do believe that because what I was seeing and hearing on the ground was um, uh, the, the synergy of two forces that were coming around from different, uh, different points and about to meet. The Donald Trump, Bernie Sanders voter, that individual actually existed. Uh, and, and so I think that there was a miscalculation and a lot of assumptions made. One of the calculations that Mitch McConnell made didn't have so much to do with the future outcome of the 2016 election, but sort of setting up in preparation for that election, holding the line on, I'm not, I was not in agreement with this then, and I still think it was, it was bad politics, even though, um, you know, Donald Trump has been able to put Supreme Court justices uh, in play. Um, but the calculation was holding the line so that the scales would not tip. The Republican Party has been much more expert at playing the Supreme Court as a political tool and actually weaponizing that tool than the Democrats. I still don't understand how the Democrats don't understand the value of the Supreme Court in their political fight. Now, that ultimately is a bad thing if both parties kind of come at uh, the Supreme Court that way. Um, and, and we've already seen how it plays out when one party has the ability to be successful um, in, in weaponizing the Supreme Court uh, the way that M Mitch McConnell did. But that is a, that is a legitimate, legitimate play um, that, uh, quite honestly, the Democratic leadership did not take seriously or outright ignored. And think would not would not amount to much, but it, it animated enough of the Republican base that it allowed them to fashion together for Trump to fashion together when he stood up and said, "Here are my nominees. These are the people you make me president. I'm giving you these guys," and they were like, "That's what we're talking about," and it sort of locked in the base, um, and it kind of moved. They moved along that Supreme Court line, and it helped. We'll see whether or not they finally get it, particularly given, you know, the news that, you know, RBG, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, was yet again hospitalized uh, for an infection uh, recently. And, um, you know, what that portends and what it may mean between now and November and certainly beyond. I got one last question. And I know Spud wants sure. to do one thing here. Um, so... You know, the last time we talked, we asked for your 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 five hip hop artists, and we, you know, Lamont had a little pro bit of a problem with it, and I think I may have, you know, had my own shade for you as well. Yeah. <laughs> Who are you listening to it, on your iPod or your iPhone or whatever? Right? Who are you listening to today? All right. So I, my taste. So you guys need to understand that I, I'm going to pull up my my list here. You guys need to understand that uh, I, I used to DJ uh, when I was in college and I uh, still do. 
uh, privately, and I, and I make so I'm I'm very big. What? What's the feed? What's the feed of book? Yeah, listen, I'm t- this is fun. We're gonna have a party and we oh, and we no, sign him in, but we need his writer right. he's coming in. When we do this, when we do this, don't worry about it. We got you. Yo, you we yo, wedding? I got weddings. I got we working. Yeah. I got <laughs> no, so so you know, I'm I'm really into um a lot of house, uh, progressive house, techno house. Um, you know, uh, I like hip hop a lot, um, and and I try to I try to mix a lot of genres in my music. So, I, I would think the art. One of my favorite uh, artists uh, uh, is Cascade. I love Cascade. I love the way he takes old school and makes it new and fresh, and and has a way of blending styles of music, um, not just electronically. But rhythmically, and and I, I just I just love his work. Uh, I really, really recently gotten hot on Elderbrook, um, which uh, is another another artist that I like uh, a lot. Because I had a feeling you guys were going to ask me this shit, so I figured <laughs> I'd just come prepared because y'all dogged the hell out of me on my hip hop <laughs> list. So I'm just not even going to let you get away with this crap this time. So I've come prepared to sort of walk into um, the genres. But I like fut- I'm, I'm big into Future House as well. And these these are styles within the house brand, if you will, of uh, that artists uh, kind of bring to the table. Um, Halsey, for example, uh, EDX, those, those types of artists that have uh, been able to take... Um, you know, some some really hard rhythmic sounds and sort of soften the edges of them in a way that, you know, they're danceable. Um, and and so, you, you know, you find yourself when you're sitting at the club and you're listening to the music or you're sitting someplace and you, you start doing this, you know. You know, and this reminds me, fellas, that maybe we should do this. I think it would be kind of cool to do, you know how people... Uh, are you know you've seen the, seen that brother at the club who's standing there dancing by himself, right? And you know he know he's he's good. You know he's got some moves, although no one else in the room is thinking that, but he is. Um, so I'm thinking, you know what we should do is we should do a thing. I'd love to see how people dance in their chairs because people dance all the time. And you know you sitting at your desk, you're working, and you know. Your shit comes on, you're like, oh hell yeah. And you start doing your thing. You're like, yay. You know, that kind of thing. So I would love to do a video like that, uh, based on the various genres that I love. But yeah, I, I'm kind of into the house uh side of uh dance music, and that's what I tend to mix. And uh and I'll throw in I'll throw in mashups with hip hop and uh old school. Um you know, rhythm and blues and stuff like that. So it's good. So one of these days we'll see you at the Chosen Few uh, weekend in Chicago, mixing. You'll see me there listening. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's what I do. I go, I go and, I, and I hit Shazam and I just, just get all the songs. <laughs> right, right. You know, it's, look, it's enough being a Republican. Just thank you very much. <laughs> a Republican who does mix it? Oh, Hell to the no. No, so, that doesn't work. So I think it's still haven't read uh, Michael Bolton's book yet, right? Michael uh, John, John Bolton. Bolton. Michael oh, Bolton. Michael sorry. Bolton is the <laughs> Can is you the woo, musician. Woo, woo, woo. You haven't read the John Bolton book yet, huh? Yeah, I need to help him out. Um, <laughs> no, I have not. Uh, actually, I a friend of mine sent me a copy of it because I wasn't buying it. What about Mary mm-hmm. Trump's book? Who? Mary Trump. Mary Trump. Oh, I can't wait for that one. Mm. Oh, oh, highly recommend the reading. Highly recommend. And here's why. Here's why. You know, say whatever the hell you want. At the end of the day, we, you and I both know that um, when you have that crazy uncle who shows up at the house for all the family events and all the things that go on in the family and someone asks you about that individual, you become a reliable source for, in terms of the credibility of what's being said about that person. And Mary brings that. She was there. She was in the house, in the room. So she's seen and knows growing up um, what, what her uncle was like and, and what uh, you know, Donald Trump was like and what his dad did. Her dad was Donald Trump's you know, 
uh, 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 brother, father, brother, 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 father, brother, cousin, mother, whatever. Brothers, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, the, so they, so the thing is, you know, a lot of people run around trying to discount it. Not only is she an expert in the field that she's in, in, in terms of psychology and psychiatry, but she, she's telling the story of watching this guy at Thanksgiving dinners and watching him at family events and being in the room. At various times, so yeah, that's gonna make a good read. That's a, that's a little <laughs> bit like a love and hip hop script, right? I mean, like you get to see exactly what's yes. happening. Hey, could you tell me what the hell is going on with <laughs> love and hip hop? I'm like, you people, is this how you spend your time? <laughs> oh my god, stop it! I, I had anyway. to stop watching it because um, I was like, this is just too much happening. So. It's just way too much. It's, I mean, they they define drama they took the story, as... the storyline way too far Woo. with Joy Reid going to full time will we see more of you on uh, MSNBC I hope so, Joy is my sister I am so happy for Joy I, 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 it is such a, an incredibly good move uh, by my network uh, to embrace what she does and, and what she brings Heart to uh, television and now for the country to see that br- at prime time to kick off the prime time uh, evening uh, programming. Uh, yeah, so I, I look forward to being on. Um, I'll be doing her sh- her last show, uh, which is going to be sort of a, a look back over the last four years on Saturdays. And then I will be there the her inaugural week uh, to welcome her to prime time and look forward to many more hours in the seven o'clock hour with her. Uh, Michael Steele, thank you so very much. We are, we we just we love yeah, you. Yeah, I, I see a hand. So uh, brother's got you, a question. I'm yes, sorry, sir. I'm uh, sorry, but can you just give that website again that uh, for the voting information? Yes, uh, check us out at usvotefoundation.org, and um, you'll you'll get on the land on the page, and it'll take you to where you need to go. Uh, to get uh, to into your state and learn all the information you need about when to vote, how to vote, where to vote, get ballots, all of that. So we we can be a portal for you to help you do that. Nice. Enjoy your day. Thank you so very much for joining us. We truly I, appreciate you, man. Um, you know, you're probably one of the coolest brothers that we've ever had on. Cool. So we just are just so honored to, you know what I'm saying, have you on again and dropping this knowledge and being, you know, very transparent about, you know, the Republican Party and about this year's election, because that's important. If you had to leave people with, you know what I'm saying, any last words, what would you tell them? Look, the uh, probably... The most important thing that we get to do as citizens is uh, to shape a nation. Uh, and black folk have been doing that for 401 years. Uh, and during the course of that, we've taken a lot for granted. Uh, and a lot have a lot has been imposed on us. But now is that hour where all of the hard work, all of the valor, all of the deaths, all of the lynchings, all of the redlining, all of that stuff um, is placed in your hands uh, when you go to the ballot box this November. So if you don't do anything uh, for the rest of this year, do not let COVID-19 be an excuse. Do not let um, your anger and frustration uh, at a particular person or party be an excuse. Please, please register and vote. I don't care. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. I'm not going to tell you how to vote. I'm just going to tell you to do it because that sacrifice was already made for you uh, and you need to honor it. Um, The excuse making is over. And then once you vote, then we work on our agenda uh, and uh, get ready for the next round to put new leadership in place. So that's that's my final word on it, folks. Um, You know what's at stake this year. I don't need to tell you that. Um, you've lived through COVID-19, you're living through a down economy, and you've watched the continual murder of your brothers on the streets at the hands of police. So you're either going to check out or you're going to stop it. Thank, Thank you, Michael Steele. Enjoy, right, my man. Brother, we truly appreciate you, Love man. You guys, you take care. Looking forward to coming back. Yeah, we, we're going to we do, do, we do the chair dance. We're going to do the chair dance thing. Well, we're going to do the chair. <laughs> you know how that goes. You know, you just do it. You know. And what I'll do, maybe the next time, 
I'll put together a little mix we can play, and then we can have some fun. We can all do a little chair dance. Yeah, oh. we'll, do it, we'll do it like um, John Lewis. I just saw his documentary last night, and we'll do, you know, do, do a little John Lewis dance. Yeah, that works. <laughs> that works. I, look, old school, baby. We can go uh, any school you want. Right. Got to keep it moving. Have a good <laughs> day, brother. Thank you, Michael. All right, guys. Take I'll care take now. Care.